Good morning, Grace Hope Church. I just wanted to let you know about a few announcements this week. First of all, we want to make sure that you're connecting on Zoom. Kindle Kids and Ignite Youth have regular weekly Zoom calls, and you can find out about those on our events page, www.gracehopechurch.org events. I also want to let you know that um, it's an exciting time here at Grace Hope Church. We're going to be reopening uh, church in June, but it's going to look different than what we're used to. And so you can check out our guidelines page that's also available on our website. And I wanted to encourage you that even though it looks different, we are going to have options for those that, that prefer to still view online. We're going to have that available. We're going to be changing the time from um, 10 a.m. for viewing online to Saturday night at 5 p.m. So make sure that you're online Saturday at 5 p.m. You go to our homepage, www.gracehopechurch.org, click on the Join Live, and you'll be able to experience the chat and see the message. And so what we're doing is we're switching to a different kind of service to where we, uh, we experience worship together, and then we also experience um, a discussion around the message. And so you'll want to come prepared Sunday at 10 a.m. You'll be getting more information about what that's going to look like in your email this week. If you need more information and you, for whatever reason, aren't on the church email list, I want to encourage you to email us at info at gracehopechurch.org, and we'll make sure your email gets added to our church list. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Good morning, Grace Hope Church. I want to introduce to you Jay Seidler. He's the director for Chi Alpha at the University of Dayton, and he has a powerful message on discipleship. Let's check it out. Good morning, Grace Hope Church. Uh, my name is Jay Seidler, as Pastor Nehemiah said. I am the director for Chi Alpha at the University of Dayton, as well as I serve as the assistant director for Chi Alphas in the entire Dayton area. We're currently on three campuses, Wright State, Sinclair, and the University of Dayton. And it's been an awesome ride to see these campuses develop over the last years. Um, thanks, and mostly due to our method of discipleship. I'm excited to work with you and talk with you today about uh, your series you're doing called Replicate, and I'm going to introduce a new term to you today called transgenerational discipleship. You may or may not have heard that term before, but I'm going to work through what that means as far as discipleship. So I want to start with a story here. Back in 2013, the house we were currently living in was turning 100 years old. It was built in 1913. And so what else would you do when you live in a house that's turning 100, except throw a party. Now, I've only lived in two houses my whole life, my parents' house and then this house, and my wife has only lived in two houses, her parents' house and this house, and so I don't know how many times in my life I'm gonna get the opportunity to celebrate a house that is turning 100, except for this. So we took advantage of it and invited our friends to celebrate this 100-year-old house. So we went to the library, we searched through old records, we found the names and the, you know, the length of the ownership of all the past owners. We looked at Dayton history, uh, what was happening in that time, especially the Great Flood, and we looked at world history, and it was super interesting. And we had trivia, and we had uh, music playing from the era. It was awesome. And one of the things that we had people do when they came to the party was to bring items to put in a time capsule that we would hide somewhere in the house. Because someday, someone will be looking through the nooks and crannies of the house, and they're going to find this time capsule, and they'll know that we were there, and they'll see that we celebrated the house. People brought some personal things. People brought some items that were, 
you know, meaningful to them, but probably meaningless, you know, when someone will open the time capsule, things that were maybe specific to 2013. And so we just sold that house and we're now moving to a new house. And I was sealing up this time capsule and uh, I realized I didn't decide how long the time capsule should be sealed for. Should it be sealed for 50 years or 100 years? Will the house be here in 50 or 100 years? And I, as I began to think about that, it struck me that in 50 years, I'm, I'm 34 years old now, in 50 years, I'll be at the end of my life. My children will be past their midlife and possibly have grown children who have children. But in a hundred years, I'll be long gone. My, my children will be dead and gone. My grandchildren will be at the end of their life and they may even have grandchildren. So that begged the question in my heart, in 50 or 100 years, what will matter? When my, when my, you know, my future descendants look at their ancestors, me and my wife, will they see that we finished the race? Will they see that we made a lasting impact on the world, that we made disciples? What will be the legacy in my family at that time? when I have dozens and dozens of descendants. We look at campus ministry as a snapshot of where the world will be. I look at campus today and I know in 10 years that society will look like my college campus. And we ask ourselves all the time, if this is my campus now, and this is the work we're doing at the University of Dayton, per se, where do we want the world to be in 10 years? And I ask you the same question today, even in the time frame of my time capsule. In 50 or maybe 100 years, where do we want the world to be? What kind of legacy do we want to leave or what do we, where do we want the kingdom of God to advance in 50 to 100 years? And what are we doing today to make that matter and that change? I'm going to share with you some of the methods that we've used about discipleship and, and working with students on campus. And this, this is not revolutionary things. I would love to say that we had the latest and greatest methods that you've never heard of, but really we have stolen everything that we do. We've stolen every method we've used and we stole it from Jesus who 2000 years ago with 12 men started a movement that is rapidly growing. Even today we're seeing the fastest growth of the church that the history of the world has ever seen. Jesus married himself to the idea of transgenerational discipleship by starting with 12 men that has now grown into a worldwide and with a worldwide movement with hundreds of millions of followers. And in the next 50 to 100 years, there'll be hundreds of millions of more followers, maybe even billions of more followers. But it started with 12. We in Chi Alpha on our campus have married ourselves to this ancient, proven method of Jesus. And this is the method of discipleship, not just for the college campus or for Chi Alpha, or for me or for my students, but for the church of the entire world. One thing I want you to understand is that we have all been commissioned as disciple makers. We have been commissioned by, as disciple makers by Jesus himself. And I want us to open up to Matthew chapter 28. 
and read that section that Jesus commissioned us in. So Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to read verses 18 to 20. I'll give you a second to turn there. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. And it says this. Then Jesus came to them, his disciples, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In the DNA of every living organism is the propensity to reproduce. Every organism, if you look at even the smallest organism, a single cell, in its DNA is the ability to replicate. The second that that cell abandons its duty to, to divide and replicate is the second that cell dies. A cell has one purpose and that is to make more life to reproduce itself. We think nothing of cows that have calves and dogs that have puppies and families that have babies. We think nothing of that because it's just part of normal life. But if we would look at cells that don't divide and dogs that don't have puppies and families that don't have babies, we see that there's a problem with that. See, me and my wife, we even battled infertility for, you know, six years. We have four kids through foster care right now. And I don't need any more children, believe me. I have four and my house is full. I can't even fit into the car seat in my minivan if I wanted to. But at the time when I had no children, there was a longing and a desire inside of me to have children. And we couldn't. And so we did what you would normally do. We went to the doctor and we saw specialists and we took tests and we took medicines and we, we did all kinds of things. Everything we could that we could reproduce and have children. And it's because we see reproducing as a normal function of every living creature. But when it comes to the church and it comes to the disciples of Jesus... Why do we stop short with that understanding of reproduction and replication? Why does that not apply to the living organism that is the church of Jesus Christ or the living being that is the disciple of Jesus? Why is it okay that we don't reproduce? Disciples are disciple makers without exception. If you consider yourself a follower and a disciple of Jesus, it is in your DNA to make disciples. To not make disciples would be to abandon the fundamental function of a disciple. It's not an added measure. It's not for advanced disciples or pro-disciples who have been around for a long time or really smart or really educated or really mature Christians. But it is the basic function of of a disciple is to make disciples above all else. Transgenerational discipleship is the method of Jesus. That we see the teachings and the, and the followers of Jesus expand and go beyond ourselves and beyond our lifetime. But I would hope that we would see generations of disciples raised up within our own lifetime, multiple generations of, of disciples, in the same way that we would expect to have gran grandchildren at some point in our life, maybe even great-grandchildren at some point in our life, we should expect to see multiple generations of disciples made within our lifetime that stem from our legacy. So the question I want to ask you as we ponder this even further is, is if, if this in fact is the primary function of a disciple of Jesus to make disciples, then do I see making disciples as the primary and chief purpose of my life? 
Well, how do I know if, if that's the chief and primary purpose of my life? Well, if you, let's look at our calendar. Does your calendar reflect disciple making? Does your wallet or bank account reflect disciple making? It was just tax season. We just did our taxes and I looked through all the things that I did with all my money this past year. And I look at those and I think my tax preparer should see that disciple making is a part of my life by the way I spend my money and time. Do my children or roommates or spouse or other family members, do they look at my life as they are with me and do they see the activities that I do as evidence that disciple making is, a, is a, not just a part of my life but the primary and chief purpose of my life? Am I leveraging every resource for disciple making? Am I leveraging all my time towards disciple making and my heart or my passions towards disciple making. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we see Paul speaking to the Corinthian church about what their purpose was as followers of Jesus. And he said this, Therefore, if anyone is in, is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, Christos Apostoli, Christ's sent ones, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This passage that Paul is sharing with the Corinthian church is the gospel and the great commission in this neat little four verses, a nutshell, a, a package with a bow on it. And this is saying that God in his great mercy and wisdom has saved us from the penalty of sin. He is saving us from the power of sin and he will save us from the presence of sin someday. We've been made new, not by works that we have done, by, but by his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And now, not only are we his followers or his children, but we are now his very righteousness and we are ambassadors of heaven. We represent heaven, the kingdom of God on the earth today. We are sent to a broken humanity who longs to be reconciled to their father that they too might become children of God. The Lord has placed us, has placed you in a strategic mission field that he has placed no one else in the world. Their, your life, your influence is full of people who have no access to the gospel. Or they do have access to the gospel and they're not responding or they don't know how to respond or they've never been asked to respond. You might have a story a lot like that where you grew up in church your entire life or around church people or, or Christian culture. But it took some person at some point in your life to approach you to ask you to respond to Jesus in the gospel. And now today I'm asking you to not only respond to the gospel but to respond to the Great Commission. You might be the only representative of heaven that person knows. The Lord has placed you for this very reason and purpose. 
that they would know Jesus and follow him. And not just follow him, but make more followers. So ask yourself, am I recognizing that as a part of my life? Am I leveraging my relationships for the gospel? Four years ago, we started meeting students from the University of Dayton. There was one student, had an Assemblies of God background, reached out to me and said, hey, I'm on campus and I want to start a Chi Alpha. I heard about Chi Alpha when I was in high school camp. What do I need to do to start a Chi Alpha on my campus? And so I started to meet with him and disciple him regularly of how to do this and how to go about this. And this is exactly what I, what I shared with him. Because in four years, he would graduate. So he had four years to start a movement of Jesus on his campus. What was he to do? So we looked at all his relationships and, and his places of influence. And he began to share with me guys that he had met on his floor and in his study groups and um, through freshman move-in and th different various freshman activities. And we began to leverage those relationships for the gospel. One of those guys' names was Michael. Michael was a freshman at this point. Aramo was the first guy, a sophomore. And Michael grew up in a, in a Christian background, but as he, he got older in high school and he, he got back to, and he got into college, he, he fell away from the Lord, started partying, partying and, and, and doing what, exactly what he wanted to do and not following Jesus. And he found himself headlong in this lifestyle that he really didn't know how to get out of. It was this cycle that just never ended. And Aramo met him one day doing a normal thing, playing ping pong. Aramo had this knack for meeting people in the everyday stuff of life and then challenging, their response, challenging them in a response to the gospel. And so one of the things he did was he would just challenge guys in the basement of his dorm to games of ping pong. And Michael happened to be the next guy that he would challenge. So as they're playing ping pong, Aramo starts to, starts to press on his relationship with Jesus, hearing that he has a Christian background, only for Michael to break down and to share with Aramo that he had not been following Jesus. And he had prayed the night before, God, send me someone to get me out of this lifestyle. And Aramo was right there. So Aramo started to disciple Michael. Um, and Michael got his life turned around and the next year started his own small group. And he met a girl named Kim. And Kim was a a sophomore, loved Jesus, and was trying to figure out how to follow Jesus in a, in a deeper way. And Michael was right there thinking, gosh, what Aramo did for me and what Jay did for Aramo, I can do for Kim. And so he just started to disciple Kim. Um, later, just a couple months later, Kim had a radical encounter with Jesus at our fall retreat, our statewide Chi Alpha fall retreat, and knew that the Lord was asking her to start her own small group in, in her dorm for girls. So she was knocking on doors down the hall asking, who wants to come to my Bible study that I'm starting? It starts tomorrow night. And she met a girl named Lindsay who was really a lot like Kim, grew up with a, a very Christian background, but was really looking how to follow Jesus more deeply. Who's going to be in my life to guide me here? And Kim is knocking on her door. So Lindsay has her life turned around and transformed by Jesus through Kim's discipleship. And Lindsay started her own small group. Now fast forward to halfway through the year with Lindsay's small group. I met a girl named Amanda at a random concert in a stadium in Columbus at the Schottenstein Center. Her name was Amanda. And I happened to be going to the bathroom and I ran into her friend uh, who knew who I was, and she said, my friend is here, and she goes to the University of Dayton. She needs good influence. Can you stay right here? I'll go get her. And so I met Amanda, who also was in a rough lifestyle, loved Jesus, but just did not know how to get back to him from where she was, was stale and stagnant, and not moving, not reproducing, not growing. And I asked Lindsay to grab onto Amanda 
and to disciple her. And Amanda's life was radically transformed in the course of that last spring semester. And Amanda started her small group this past year. And I'm proud to say that this school year, Amanda raised up three new disciple makers in her very first small group. And just this morning, I met another girl from the Cleveland area who will be attending the University of Dayton. And I passed her on to Amanda's disciple, Juliana, who is excited to follow up with her very first disciple when fall comes and through this summer. This, these events happened in a period of four years. In the last four years, we raised up 24 disciple makers who have started small groups who, with people they did not know. Some, many of them were not saved or did not know Jesus or had a very nominal Christian background. But we've raised up 24 disciple makers who start small groups. Just this year, we had nine small groups on our campus. And those nine small group leaders raised up nine brand new small group leaders that will start their own small groups next year, Juliana being included in that. This is just four years of fruit on our little campus with our brand new ministry with students that just want to know who, how to follow Jesus and love him. But they're leaving their mark on the world. Our goal is that every year, every single leader would raise up a new leader i.e. every disciple would raise up a new disciple, not just, and not just every disciple, but every disciple maker would, make, would raise up a disciple maker. I just counted this morning, just recounting what's been happening on our campus, and we currently sit at eight generations of disciples in four years. That's just four years on a college campus. Think of a Christian who has been following Jesus for 20 or 30 years. How many generations of disciples could come out of their legacy as they make more disciple makers maybe every year of their life? In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, it says, In the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. This is where I get the term transgenerational discipleship. We see Paul speaking to Timothy, generation one, generation two, who will entrust what he has heard from Paul to other reliable people, generation three, who will be qualified to teach others, generation four. Four generations of disciples and disciple makers in one scripture. Transgenerational discipleship is the method of Jesus. We are blessed to come from a lineage of disciple makers. Everyone watching this video, watching this message, you are part of a lineage that, that dates all the way back to Jesus himself as generation one, passing down to one of the twelve, passing down to this humongous family tree of God, of his kingdom, all the way to you, all the way to me. Disciples who make disciples, because that's what disciples do. Transgenerational discipleship is the method of Jesus. Will the line die with you? Will you be the one in this, this thousands of year long family tree where your branch be cut short? Or will you make disciples? Will you replicate? Will you reproduce? Eli Gotro is a Chi Alpha director in Texas and he says this, the heart of discipleship rests in gratitude. It's out of an extension and a gratitude to Jesus of what he has done in our life that we allow him to do it through our life. What God has done to you, he wants to do through you. So three questions, or two questions I want you to, re to 
respond, as you meditate on, on what I've, I've taught you this morning or shared with you. One, does my life reflect the level of gratitude that I have towards Jesus by making disciples? Does my life reflect my gratitude toward Jesus for what he's done to me by making disciples? And the second question is, is more practical in nature. Is what relationships in my life is the Lord currently asking me to leverage for the sake of the gospel? What is he asking me to leave behind? Well, how is he looking to adjust my calendar or my wallet or my family? To poise ourselves to making disciples. Thanks for letting me share with you this morning. Wow, Grace Hope Church, what an amazing message on discipleship. Thank you, Jay Seidler, for sharing your heart and uh, the vision that God's given you. And I'm so excited to, to hear that your vision is so similar to our vision here at Grace Hope Church, which is making disciples who make disciples based off of Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. Church, God is with us as we are embarking on this journey to make disciples. We don't have to do it all alone, but we can do it with his help. And so let's pray and let's ask him right now to help us as we're on this journey together. And I want to encourage you, if you um, are not a part of a House of Hope, uh, to get involved in a small group uh, at, a, at a House of Hope, whether that's on a Zoom call or whether that's in person. I want to encourage us to continue to meet together and continue to share fellowship as we see the day approaching. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for what we've heard today. I pray that you would help us to get to that place where we're ready, Lord, to give up whatever you want us to give up, to see people discipled because of our gratitude, because we're thankful for what you did for us. And we want to see that same life change in someone else. And I thank you, Lord, for giving us your compassion for people, for giving us your um, inspiration, and also helping us to act because faith without deeds is dead. And I thank you so much for what we've heard today. Help it to come alive in our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.